In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You'd better stop crying, and you'd better start praying. Clad in white and pushing a dry mop, the woman in my hospital room came more clearly into my view. I had indeed begun crying after hours of a labor that had taken a bad turn and the intensity of that delivery and its aftermath. My newborn son, now on a ventilator, had been wheeled away by the transport team to take him to a nearby hospital with higher level trauma care. A young doctor who had put a gentle hand on my shoulder and asked if I'd had anyone at home who could support me in the days ahead, then left the room softly closing the door behind him. It was his small act of kindness that unleashed the floodgates of grief, along with all of the fear that I had been pushing down over the preceding hours. Alone, or so I thought, my tears rose up from the depths, sweeping me up and carrying me along on a powerful wave. I was lost in that reverie when an emphatic voice belonging to the woman in white cut through the din and verbally slapped me. Stilling her mop and leaning on it, she shook her head and said, you'd better stop crying and you'd better start praying. Stunned, I stared at her uncomprehending as she returned in silence to completing her task. And soon she too rolled away her cart, the door closing softly behind her, leaving me alone in my room to wait for word from my family who had gone ahead with the baby. Shocked out of my tears, I was left to sit in numbness and solitude and to ponder an odd revelation. Better start praying. As a young mother newly returned to the church, I didn't even know how to pray, much less what to pray. Yet something in her voice had convinced me that I was about to find out. This encounter with an abrupt stranger in white turned out to be the first in a number of astonishing moments in the weeks that were to come, a raucous month of wild ups and downs that ended with a child miraculously restored to health and rejoining his family in his home. And one young mother, newly aware that her understanding of God's work in the world had been sorely lacking in holy imagination. Men of Galilee, why are you standing around gaping at the sky? Surely this question from the strangers in white robes broke in through a cloud of incomprehension. Jesus' stunned followers, staring at the last point they'd seen him, must have been wondering, now what? They were certainly not unaccustomed to witnessing his miracles. Many of them had experienced years of disruption and disorientation by now. A charismatic teacher who bid them to drop their nets and follow, who had shown them a new way of being in the world, of being in his world. They had watched helplessly as he was snatched from them by treacherous worldly politics, they had retreated as he endured a brutal and painful end, and then, in ways that no one could have imagined, he blew their hearts wide open with joy when they experienced him alive and among them again. And now they stare at the sky. In what must have been a bit of deja vu all over again, they stand stunned, perhaps replaying the tape in their heads and wondering, what did he just say? And the figures who appear in white cut through their fog saying, get on with it. Get back to Jerusalem and wait. You will see him again, or perhaps more succinctly, you'd better stop staring and you'd better start praying. For this unexpected yet world altering event has changed, is changing everything, and you're going to need to get ready. For Jesus had told them, he had told them that he was going to return to the Father, and he had assured them that he was going to send another, an advocate. But first, he would complete the work that he had to accomplish, having taken on humanity, 
harrowing death and breaking its dominion over the frailty of our ordinary lives. Jesus completes God's mission of union with the beloved daughters and sons whom he called to return. Having taken on human flesh, he takes that vulnerable humanity, transformed and glorified, straight back into the heart of God, into the eternal love that is and was and is to come, carrying him, you, and me along with him, all of this broken creation. And so perhaps, perhaps staring stripped of speech is the appropriate response in the face of such a mystery, such glory. And yet, while the ascension event is a completion of sorts, it is not the end. It is the hinge point between Jesus' presence in Palestine within one human lifetime and Jesus' presence for all time with all people who walk within the vulnerability of a human life. The author of Luke ends his account of the gospel of Jesus' life with his account of Jesus' ascension. And that same author begins volume two of his story, the Acts of the Apostles, his account of the launching of Jesus alive amongst us, carried in the lifeblood of his community. He launches that account in the same way. The narrator of Acts begins the story of the church with Jesus's ascension and with the promise of a new power to descend upon them soon. Who could know what to make of Jesus's words? Soon the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, in all the known world. They couldn't have known how, but they knew that. They didn't know what exactly Jesus was saying to them, but they knew that he always did what he said he was going to do. And so they returned to Jerusalem to wait. Their whiplashed souls could not possibly have foreseen how their small band of men and women would give flesh to Christ's body in the world. And empowered by the Holy Spirit would turn the known world upside down in their day and to this very day. But they knew that they were God's beloved, and they knew that they were being enlisted in some way in God's ongoing project of redemption. Biblical commentator Matt Skinner points out that this waiting period at the beginning of the action-packed book of Acts might be easy enough for us to skip over. Yet, he says, the interval makes an important point about how God will interact with these people. Presumably, the Holy Spirit could have come immediately after Jesus' ascension, he says, but God waits. Rather, God has Jesus' followers wait, that in this waiting, they learn or begin to learn that they are to be a responsive community, a community that waits upon God to initiate. Whether they walk back to Jerusalem from the ascension with eager energy or paralyzing fear, we do not know. All we know is that they have to wait. This waiting, he says, has an active quality to it, going beyond merely sitting around and contemplating the past and future. The apostles wait secluded in a room upstairs where they are constantly devoting themselves to prayer, along with others who follow Jesus, both men and women. The group remains sequestered yet expectant. In their waiting, they obey Jesus' recent commands, but even more, they also express a readiness for the wild stuff yet to come. The waiting period conditions them to be attentive to God so that they might respond when the time is right. They wait in a context of enormous and not fully explained expectations. They live in uneasy anticipation of the new realities that Jesus has initiated. Living like this requires just as much courage as if Jesus had told them to go out immediately and change the world under their own steam. And so they wait, not because they see it as their only option, 
but because they expect big things to come from God, things in which they will be privileged to play important roles. And so for you and me in these strange and disorienting days when many of us might be caught staring up at the sky, uncomprehending, we too might hear a voice breaking in, verbally shaking us, saying, you'd better stop obsessing about a virus and you'd better start praying. A voice breaking through our stupor, telling us to be ready, to be ready and to wait, sequestered yet expectant, and ready when the time is right for the wild things yet to come. For surely God is not finished with us yet. For the community that found its footing in the joy of the resurrection was soon sent forth into the known world in new and unexpected ways. We, like they, wait on God's Holy Spirit and we wait in hope. We wait in strength. We wait in vulnerability. And we wait in the confidence that God's project in this world has not come to its end, but is always and eternally being made new. For we are reminded in Jesus' ascension that God was marking a beginning, a beginning that seems to have felt a lot like disorientation, a beginning that surely must have felt like loss, but a beginning in which God completes the work of the incarnation through Jesus, who raises us up, and carries us along with him and all of humanity into abundance of life and into the very heart of God. Amen. <laughs>